Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 258, which reads as follows. Natena pandito hoti yavata bahubhasati kemi aweri abhayo panditoti pavuchati which means one is not a pandit simply because one talks a lot one who is safe vengeless fearless is rightly called a pundit so this verse was told in response to an issue that arose regarding an infamous group of monks called the group of six I guess because there were six of them but they became infamous, infamous the group of six monks they became an infamous group of troublemaker monks who often tried to find ways to skirt around the rules and yet maintain their status as monks Reading their stories, you might wonder why they weren't just kicked out. But it's a testament to, or it's a, a lesson. It, show, it shows something about Buddhism that we're tolerant and patient and uh, non-authoritarian. So we, allowing people to learn on their own and only, only uh, taking action in cases where a line has been crossed and, and taking appropriate action not simply deciding that we don't want someone and kicking them out the story is quite short so there's not much to tell and I'll just make a note that this is has already been the case, I think I've mentioned it as well, but one thing about the Dhammapada is the commentary is that it starts off with long, elaborate, generational sometimes stories epic in some cases, but starts to lose steam as it goes along and I'm not sure why exactly, but by the end or by the middle even, the stories, many of the stories become quite short so the story is that these group of six were setting themselves up to be something like pundits. So they would, a pundit in the, in the West is someone who is an expert on things. In the time, the word pundit comes from directly from the Sanskrit. We, in English we see on TV these political pundits or so on. It means an expert on some topic, someone who goes and on shows or goes in public and, and speaks on a topic. And it, it takes those those ideas from the original meaning of the word, someone who, a pandita, a san, it's, this, it's originally from the Sanskrit word pandita, the Sanskrit Pali word, which means someone who is, who is learned, who is wise, who is an expert. <clears throat> it, it really took on a, a meaning of its own in many cultures. So in the Buddha's time, I'm sure it had the meaning of that sort. Someone who was um, not just wise living in the forest, but wise in an expressive sort of way. Someone who was uh, a teacher, who was a uh, lecturer, is kind of, not exactly, but, but it was involved with lecturing, involved with talking on subjects. Hence the word, or the, the, the phrase, not simply because they speak a lot. It's not so we often translate pandita as wise one, but it means something I think a little bit more specific. It certainly does in most cultures. In Thai culture they have a word pandit and I'm sure in the other Buddhist cultures they also use the word. 
Bandit in, in Thai. So these six monks were, I guess, pushing their opinions on people and challenging anyone else who would uh, debate them. Challenging not in a fair way, not in a, in a debate sense, but insulting them and apparently even abusing them. So they would they would um, strut around in the Dhamma hall or in the in the main hall where the monks would gather, and they would go from monastery to monastery doing this, strutting around, um, spouting off and and abusing anyone else who um, tried to criticize them or argue with them or even tried to to teach anything. So if if lay people might come, they would. Um, they would ask questions and the monks would try to answer and these six monks would just uh, insult them and, and ridicule them and even apparently um, the, the text says they would um, grab them and put, dump a uh, dustbin you know the, the little the dustpan all over them with, with uh, the sweepings is what it is the stuff that you sweep out they dump it over their heads quite 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 terrible behavior. And so one day a, a novice was coming from the hall and, and the monks were asking, oh, how is it going in there? And they said, don't ask me how it's going. This group of six monks is, you know, they just dumped all the sweepings on my head. That's how, how terrible they are. Sort of taking control of the, the place. I think maybe something's lost in the translation as well. I just can't quite picture what the, how they were acting, but they were acting quite reprehensible. And so the monks were were quite surprised by this and concerned, and so they brought their concerns to the Buddha, and the Buddha taught this verse. He said, no. Yeah, these guys are not bandits. So it's a it's first of all a lesson if we before we talk about how it relates to our practice. It's a lesson in teaching because that often becomes a part of everyone's practice. Uh, as a meditation practitioner, you are, are often confronted with the opportunity to talk about what you have become increasingly an expert on. You know, the more you practice, the more effort you put into it, the more you the time you spend cultivating mindfulness, uh, the more proficient you are at it. And we always have to remember it's much more important to maintain positive qualities of mind and a positive attitude. We have to be teaching for the right reasons. It's quite common in the beginning for people to teach with um, a, 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 an agenda or a, a pushy attitude, you know, a, a strong conviction that they feel everyone else should share. And a conviction can often run far ahead of wisdom such that uh, we don't accept that people might uh, reject our meditation and so we can become upset and uh, unmindful when dealing with people who, who are not interested in what it, we're so interested in. Absolutely, there, there is no need to talk a lot. And that's something we should always keep in mind when we relate to others, when, when we teach the Dhamma. It's not about how much you talk. It's not about how little you talk either. Talking very little has the benefit of not uh, saying the wrong thing, uh, but it's not necessarily the right thing either. Sometimes there are words that need to be spoken. That's not the problem. It's just not simply because one talks a lot that one is wise. So how this relates to our practice, because our practice, of course, isn't about teaching, and I hope you're not teaching each other during your course or teaching anyone during your course. 
during your practice you are trying to teach yourself. And so the, the verse itself, the word pandita, can be just seen as one who is wise, and in that way it very much does relate to our practice. Wisdom is very much the goal that we're seeking. It's just important to understand uh, what is meant in Buddhism by wisdom, because it's not really how we think of it in the West or, or in any, in modern times. Because in modern times what is esteemed and prized is often intellect, cleverness, skill in argument, skill in logic. And all of those things are generally positive qualities, but they aren't wisdom. Wisdom has much more to do with your outlook and your familiarity with reality, your connection with reality. Like someone who is out of touch, we say in English, is the idea of someone who isn't wise. If they're out of touch with reality, we say that in many ways with, with uh, worldly topics, but someone who is literally out of touch with reality in the sense they're living in the past, they're living in the future, or they're caught up in judgment, someone who is very much a victim of their own partialities, biases, views, opinions, beliefs, those sorts of things. This is someone who we might say is out of touch. And another way of putting it, it's actually int quite interesting that the Buddha would um, choose these three words, because they aren't everything that is meant by someone who is wise, and they do relate very much to the story. The, these guys, it's not that their wisdom is synonymous, or, or someone's wisdom is synonymous with these three qualities, it's that a person who is in touch with reality would never act in the way that these monks were, so there's no way that they could be considered wise. So, well, while these three qualities are not everything it means to be wise, they do give us a hint at the connection between ethics and wisdom, which is another thing that is often not clearly understood in modern times. I, and I think often people who come to Buddhism, Buddhist practice, uh, don't realize the important connection. In fact, the intrinsic connection between ethics and, and wisdom. It's not that ethics and wisdom are connected, really. It's that ethics and wisdom are are inseparable. They're 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 in many ways one and the same. Well, they're 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 very much a part of the same thing. It, meaning, wisdom is all about your your ethics, how you treat others, how you react, how you how you interact with reality. If you get angry, that's not simply um, a manifestation of lack of wisdom, it, it, it is directly unwise. It is an unwise state of mind. So in some ways these three qualities of, of being um, of, of being safe, of being vengeless, which is a word we don't use much in English, but it's the opposite of vengeful someone who doesn't have vengeance um, and 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 free from from dan free from fear or fearless the curious thing about these words is that from the sounds of it they sound like something positive for oneself that I don't have any fear uh, I am safe from harm from others and I am um, well, the second one, when you hear it, it usually means the opposite. It means ven I I'm not vengeful towards others. So it relates very much to the story. But the thing about these words is they can go both ways. In Pali, see, in, 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 in English, they often have a very definite meaning one way or the other. But in Pali, um, Kami, one who is safe, um, well, it, it can go both ways, and I think it's useful for us to talk about it both ways. And what I mean is, safe can mean I am safe from the harm that others bring, but it can also mean I am safe in the sense I am safe to talk to, I am safe to be around, I am safe for other people. It is safe to be around me. Yeah. 
And that's very much related to the story, so I think it's very impertinent. But it's also very much related to our practice. Our practice, th these three words are, I think, really instructive, and I'll, I'll try to explain why. Instructive in, in understanding how our practice works, what the benefits are of being mindful, what the benefits are of wisdom, and what the goal is in our practice. So being safe in terms of your own safety from the harm that, that others might bring and, and the harm that, that might come to you from any source. It's important to understand that this sort of safety, um, meditation, the safety that meditation or mindfulness brings in this regard is very different from the safety you bring to others by being mindful. By being mindful, it, you absolutely do bring safety to others. How are you safe? How are others safe from you? I mean, it should be quite obvious. All of the harm that we might cause intentionally to others comes from bias, comes from partiality. We can't hurt others intentionally or, or, or bring intentionally bring harm to others with wisdom or, or with objectivity. You, you harm others out of cruelty, you harm, harm others out of fear. All of these things that you come to understand in meditation as being harmful. An interesting thing about the self-other dichotomy is that it's not, um, it, it's not, it's dissonant to wish for yourself to be free from suffering and to harm others, to bring suffering to others. If I myself learn, as a part of being mindful, the sorts of qualities of mind that harm myself, I, I can't ever want them for myself. You just It just isn't possible. The familiarity, the being in touch with them that comes from being mindful creates this dissonance. You just can't abide by them hurting yourself. You start to see that that's what we do in life. We hurt ourselves. And you start to see that, um, well, you, you see it as just that, hurting yourself. And there's an incapacity to continue. You're unable to hurt yourself. Mindfulness doesn't just give you the opportunity to, to decide better. It makes you incapable of hurting yourself. At the same time, it makes you incapable of hurting others. Because they are one and the same. They, have this, they involve the same mind states. You can't absolutely know and be clearly in touch with what is to your benefit and not act for the benefit of others. It just can't happen. There's that. There's a dissonance there. There would be a dissonance in the mind that mindfulness doesn't allow. It, it of course comes up when you're not mindful, but cannot exist with someone who is in touch with reality. It's this wonderful quality of, of reality that we can't possibly harm ourselves or others if we're in touch with reality. It's just a very profound truth, one of the core truths of Buddhism, that wisdom is simply being in touch with reality. And when you're in touch with reality, you don't have any problem with, with ignorance or, or delusion or making a mistake. Uh, any mistakes you made are purely uh, accidental, they're accidents. So, so that really sort of sums up what it means to, to bring safety to yourself and to others at the same time. That safety you bring to others is very visceral. You no longer hurt others physically. You no longer hurt others verbally. You no longer act in such a way as to manipulate others. All of these safeties are very real and physical. They're the kind of thing that we wish for ourselves. Unfortunately, mindfulness doesn't bring so much of that sort of safety to yourself, right? Your mindfulness is not going to uh, control what other people do. It's certainly not going to control the weather or, or, or natural disasters or your the economy or these sorts of things, right? So mindfulness doesn't make you safe from the sorts of harm that you bring to others. It's an incredible benefit that we bring to the world, we can feel so good about ourselves. The more mindful we are, the more in touch with reality we are, because of how uh, free people become from our our um, from our harm. But the safety that it brings to us 
is important to understand as well. And I, I already kind of touched upon it. It's the freedom from bias, from partiality. Because the truth of suffering involves quite explicitly reaction, judgment. A person who is perfectly in touch with reality can and will still suffer physically. They can still be hurt, hit, hurt physically by others. They can be, of course, accosted with verbal abuse. Um, they can be met with circumstances that create loss. But what is missing is the um, the reaction to these experiences, the judgment, the the upset and the stress that comes to people who don't cultivate mindfulness, who are out of touch with reality. So, which is in fact a much more important uh, sort of safety. That in fact one of the things that we stress in mindfulness practice is that it's not the pain or the experiences in general that are unpleasant or, or suffering. It's how we react to them. It's our inability to uh, face them. Our inability to maintain our peace of mind in the face of these experiences. And that's distinct from the experience itself. It isn't a foregone conclusion that we're going to dislike pain or be upset by pain. And in fact, what that means is that pain is in fact not stressful or painful or well, it's not unpleasant. It's possible to be completely at peace and still experience any number of undesirable uh, experiences. And that's, of course, an incredible safety. It's really the only safety because we can bring uh, our safety to others but we also cannot ensure their complete safety just by our our actions. We can't protect other, anyone else from old age, sickness, and death. And, and not to mention all the uh, many other possible consequences of their actions and of the actions of those around them. So that's in regards to safety. The most important safety is always going to be our own uh, safety. Uh, of, of wisdom the second one vengeless also goes both ways uh, the word vera I use the word vengeance I'm not sure that that's what, what vera means it's what it means in Thailand and I was told quite explicitly that that's how I had to translate it um, but I think it actually is something a bit simpler um, The, the idea of vengeance is is very common in Buddhist culture and 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 Buddhist texts. There's a uh, I think it's a Dhammapada or a Jataka story, a very famous story of this. It might be somewhere else actually. There's a story of these two women who uh, are married to the same man. It was a in India at the time of the Buddha. Or, or in 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 those times, it was a male-dominated society, and men would marry as many women. Rich men would marry as many women as they wanted. And so these two women had the same husband, and one of them was very jealous of the other. And so she uh, put some nettles in this woman's bed. I think is this terrible thing she did. She ended up killing the woman. Uh, killing the woman and her baby or something, just horribly. That's right, the woman got pregnant, and this other woman was very uh, jealous of her. And so she killed the woman. She she gave the, she gave caused the woman to, to have an abortion, I think, drank, gave her some drink. And the, the, the woman died along with the baby as a result of it. Like, the story eludes me exactly, but the woman died, and when she died, this woman realized that the other woman had poisoned her. 
and killed her baby and killed her and as she was dying she vowed she said i'm going to in 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 some future life one day i'm going to kill you and your babies <laughs> and she died and was born a cat in that very house apparently and when the husband found out he was very angry and he was not a very nice man as well and he killed his wife he beat her to death the other wife she died and she was born as a chicken in the same house and when she grew up as a chicken she had she had little chicks she gave birth to little chicks and this cat one day saw the, the chicken with the chicks and immediately remembered. Didn't maybe know why, but knew right away what to do. And killed the hen, killed the hen and her chicks. And the hen and the chicks were born as a cougar or a lion or something, a tiger maybe, some wild cat. And the cat, when the cat died, was born as a deer in the same forest as the wild cat. And one day they met again and the wild cat, the, the, the mother deer was had a child and the, the cougar killed the, the deer and back and forth and back and forth. Every lifetime this happened until finally in the time of the Buddha, this woman was, one of them was born a woman, and the other was born a, uh, a demon, a yaka, a yakini, uh, these, this race of beings like an ogre. And she was bathing in a pool near Jetavana, where the Buddha was living. Uh, a pool, there's, there was a pool apparently just outside of Sawati, so if you, you can walk, you could walk from Sawati to Jetavana. So just outside of Sawati there was the bathing pools and she was bathing at one of these ponds, sort of lake, small lake maybe. And she had put her baby uh, down and there she was bathing in the pond and the Yakini, the, the demon woman, came up and saw her and they looked at each other and they met their eyes met and they recognized right away like the, from lifetime after lifetime these two had been at each other's throats and the woman became incredibly completely froze and then jumped up grabbed her baby and ran and ran straight into Jetavana straight into the Buddhist monastery near Savati now the the thing about yak, yakas and yakinis is uh, Jetavana being a, a monastery belonging to the Buddha was of course surrounded and 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 um, was a home to various angels, various devas, and so there were devas at the gate who stopped, prevented the yakini from entering. And this woman ran into Jetavana and the Yakini ran after her and stopped at the gate and was stopped by the, the Devas. And this woman ran into Jetavana with her baby and ran up to where the Buddha was sitting with all the monks teaching and took her baby and deposited him, her baby at the feet of the Buddha and said, Please, Venerable Sir, save me and my child. This is a story. I mean, believe it or not, this is... This is what a story that we often tell the Buddha asked her what had happened she explained that what she knew that she knew right away that this beast was going to eat her child and the Buddha had the monks call the Yakini in and this Yakini came walking in and the Buddha lectured them and the point I mean, it's a it's it's related to this story just because it talks about this word Vera so if you've never heard about this, the importance of this concept in Buddhism, you can understand how uh, important it is, and how we often think about the nature of this, the nature of of samsara as containing this element of 
uh, unrequited vengeance. And so the Buddha said to them, you know, countless lives you have been after each other's throats. He says, what is, when is it going to end? And he, ex expl he taught them and he, he related to them their past lives that they couldn't remember and uh, helped them to see that there was no value in any of this and helped them to become friends and end their, their vengeance. So that's a, the, the common story about this word vera. But I think vera can just mean enmity of any sort. Like these monks were hostile. Um, but it, it, it does often take on the meaning of relating to holding a grudge. And so, of course, someone who is wise should not hold a grudge and should not uh, react at all, obviously. But it's a good sign of, of a lack of wisdom when you do hold on to some en en enmity. It's a common thing to come up in meditation. You will think of people who you have a problem with and who make you upset. Could be family members, could be fellow employees or employers or that sort of thing. Um, and there's also, it will come up of course, those people who have enmity towards you those people who hold a grudge against you, those who you have wronged perhaps, or those who have have bad intentions towards you. And a pandita, a, a wise person, of course, doesn't have this as well. You, you become free from vengeance from others because you, you not entirely always, but um, you gain this capacity to appease, to, to placate others through kindness, through compassion. And you find yourself not, not of course, always, you can't control others, but much more you find yourself surrounded by those who have uh, positive qualities of mind. You cultivate that in others. You cultivate respect in others because of your kindness, because of your thoughtfulness, because of your patience and your wisdom. So this is the second quality. The third quality, uh, abhaya. Abhaya relates somewhat to the others, and especially the first one. Baya means fear or danger. Sort of literally fear. So someone who is fearless is a sign of, of wisdom but also someone who who doesn't uh, inspire fear in others or someone who others need not fear. And so how this is different from, from safe, if someone is safe, it's interesting because safe can describe uh, any person and it can, it, it can just, any person who has positive circumstances. Right, all of us are probably quite safe from most dangers living here, right? Irrespective of our meditation practice, people, most people in this city are reasonably safe, safe from war. Um, many people are are in this society are safe from poverty, safe from hunger, safe from disease. Not completely, but we can live most of our lives, much of our lives, quite safe. The difference um, in this regard is, is many people who are safe still have fear. A person can be completely safe and still terrorized by unreasonable fear. Even reasonable fear. Reasonable in the sense that it absolutely is the pos is a, is possible for any one of us to suddenly become unsafe, to suddenly be confronted with danger. This house could collapse. Uh, any one of us could get sick at any time. Uh, we could be robbed. We could be uh, attacked. We could be run over by a car. We could be get in a car accident. Anything can happen. So many things. 
And for some people this is quite fearsome. But uh, a sign of someone who is wise is someone who is fearless. Sometimes we think of fear as being useful, but it's one of these cases where we mix up what is useful from, from what is uh, ancillary. So n understanding the dangers does not require a person to be afraid. This is important in our meditation practice. Through the meditation, you're going to appreciate very much the danger in clinging, the danger in reacting, the danger in judging, the danger in losing touch with reality. But at the same time, you're going to lose your fear. So you end up in a state, a quality of mind, that is at once very conscious of that which is dangerous in terms of mind states, but also in terms of life in general. You're capable, very, very much more than most people, of appreciating and assessing danger. But you are completely, or you are more and more through your practice, free from any sort of fear. So a, a, f a fearless person is not someone who ignores danger. These are two very different things, two distinct things. But, they ha but a person who has fear cannot be seen as wise. A person should never have fear. Fear is not a wholesome state. And it's a mistake that we make to think that it is the as ability to assess danger. Is actually talked about in the texts because it's an important part of the practice to see the danger, to see the baya. It's called baya, like to see the fear. But it doesn't mean you become afraid. It's explicitly stated you don't. Practice doesn't make you afraid. Practice helps you see the fearsomeness of clinging. But of course it encourages you not to cling. It doesn't make you afraid. And on the other side, of course, meditation means others have nothing to fear from you. It, of course, doesn't mean that others will not fear you. Uh, it, hopefully it makes them fear you less. But very much more that people have nothing to fear from you. And this is a very powerful result of the practice that you might not think about, you might not have thought about. But for just the simple example of keeping the five precepts. It's often described as being what we call abhaya dana. Dana meaning a gift. It's a gift of fearlessness. And what that means is nobody has anything to fear from you. If you don't kill, you have suddenly given a gift to all beings when you absolutely, unequivocally, without any um, Ifs or but ifs, ends or buts. Undertake not to kill a living being. You have given freedom to the universe. You have given freedom from fear. This is called abhayadana. When you don't steal, when you don't cheat or lie or uh, in any way harm, when you undertake not to harm others. And again, this relates back to safety. But you'll give people a re no reason to fear you. You become someone that others can trust and generally do trust and generally do uh, rely upon and feel safe around. That's a great, great thing about goodness. You know, it, it, it doesn't really bear mentioning because it's so obvious, but it's funny how it should be so obvious and yet it's not that goodness is good and goodness is is um, that which leads to leads others to see you as good. We often take shortcuts in this regard with other people trying to impress them, trying to uh, boast and and pr push on them our good qualities trying to manipulate them or scare them into respecting us. None of which is goodness, and yet it's goodness that benefits us and benefits others. So this is why 
wisdom has so much to do with ethics it's not independent wisdom is not scientific discovery or it is scientific discovery but the science that sci modern scientists haven't discovered uh, is that there is something intrinsically uh, real about ethics and goodness that they are an intrinsic part of reality because reality is based on experience okay so that's uh, quite a lot of talk about a, a verse that was about not talking a lot or about wisdom not being about talking a lot but I hope that the topics are uh, pertinent and helpful for your practice and I wish you all success and progress in your practice. Thank you for listening.